How you doing? You look good? Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, not sure if you heard, um, but yeah, my second book came out uh, this week, July 1st. It's called Carve, and um, it's on how to steward and sustain uh, a move of God, and there's uh, basically six disciplines in order to kind of carve out uh, a revival realm, and, uh, uh, and so that's what this is, and, um, uh, and I'm really excited about it. The reason why I'm excited about it is because in the past, a book like this would be uh, only for full-time church leaders. Um, and, and what I love about this is that uh, I, I'm equipping the saints for works of ministry. And it's basically, uh, I, I share a lot of my own experiences. We're, we're, our family is part of uh, quite a few several move, moves of God back in the 90s. Uh, we were part of the uh, Toronto Blessing. So we actually went to Toronto. We went to Brownsville. We went to um, Rodney Howard Brown. We stood in all the different lines all, in, in all those different atmospheres. Um, we hosted a move of God here in Seattle from 94 to 97. Um, we were part of a move of God in, uh, in uh, Northern Ireland uh, that was called Fireland, and so that was supposed to be a conference, and they just kept going. Um, uh, the, the hallmark of that move was 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 the, was the drums, was this prophetic warfare that broke out in that move of God. Our family went to uh, Australia to be part of a, a conference, and it extended, and our family was there uh, for, for over a year of constant meetings. They outgrew the church. They were in a tent and, and all that kind of thing. So we've, we, we've got to see a lot, um, And um, uh, uh, but w- one of the things that, that we noticed is that uh, sometimes moves of God kind of come and go, and, um, and I don't believe that that's God's will. I don't think that, that, um, that the Welsh revival uh, only went for, uh, was it three years or two years? It only went for three years, 100,000 people get saved, uh, and, and an entire nation gets transformed, and then God says, well, I'm done with Wales. I'm done with Wales. I'm going to move on to another country. I, I don't think God ever said that. You know, um, uh, it's not that God desires to stop moving, it's that man gets in the way. Yeah, and sometimes man thinks too highly of himself. And I believe that what God is about to do is that we're about to see a move of God, um, uh, and, it, and it's going to be very, um, uh, 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 it's going to begin to take place on a grassroots level, which means that I believe it's going to be the people of God that carry the next move of God, so that, there, so that uh, one man or organization or institution is actually incapable of subverting the next move of God. I believe that we're about to see a third great awakening that no person, place, thing, demonic principality will have the ability or the authority to subvert this next move of God. I believe it's going to go from glory to glory. It's going to be without ebb and it's going to be without end. And we're going to, we're going to begin to see a momentum take place, the kind of momentum that terrifies Satan so that we can begin to see the harvesting of cities and nations. And so, uh, so this isn't just for full-time leaders. This is, uh, I like what Bill Johnson says. He says, revival begins at home. And I believe that we're about to see a move of God that's going to be stewarded in our workplaces. It's going to be stewarded um, in our homes. Uh, it's going to be stewarded, uh, 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 and, and it's going to be all. It's going to be the body of Christ knit together, many members, various uh, 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 giftings and and, uh, and and values, and it, it's going to be crazy diverse. But we're going to be knit together, and Jesus is going to be glorified. Jesus is going to be glorified. Yeah, so um, it, it's a wineskin book. I don't think that there's any shortage of wine. I think that there's a big shortage of wineskins. I don't think that there's any pre- uh, shortage of the manifest presence of God. Uh, in fact, uh, this atmosphere is full of new wine this morning. It's, the question isn't, is there wine this morning? The question is, is there a wineskin here this morning that's willing to take this presence and begin to steward it? Begin to, the, the, a people that would say yes to the Lord, yes to the manifest presence presence of God and says, hey, we will host the Ark of the Covenant here. We will host the Ark in our home. We will host his presence. We will embrace the reproach. We will embrace the embarrassment and we will embrace the spirit of the fear of the Lord that is contingent in order to not be killed by this awesome, awe-inspiring God. Yep, 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 yep. So part of that, part of that is talking about the book. Part of that is me just uh, 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 processing through what's what's in me, also, and a part of it is me re- representing this morning the DNA of this house. That if you cut this house, we will bleed revival. We will bleed awakening. I believe that we are not waiting on a move of God. I believe that Seattle Revival Center is a move of God, and that if you're here this morning, you 
are a part of a move of God and that it is not our responsibility as a house in and of itself to steward this. It's our responsibility as families and individuals to say yes to the Lord and to do our part to run with this fire uh, for our generation. Yep, 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 yep. Anyways, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. And uh, I want to give this to uh, my brother Phil, this man of God. Uh, lost his precious daughter this last week to Huntington's disease. And, uh, bro, I want to give this to you. I want to sow this into you. Just a small little thing. Because, brother, I believe that you have sowed even your own uh, a, a family. And I believe that you have a, a harvest of awakening and souls that are coming to you. So, uh, uh, Roy, can you run this to Phil? And, uh, Phil, you are, you are an example of a man of God. And so we just, we bless you. Would your family, would you and your family stand? We want to bless you. Would you, body of Christ, would you just stretch out your arms? If you're anywhere around them, would you just lay hands on them? We declare grace and peace be unto you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit would come upon you, and that the Holy Spirit would be your comforter, and that the grace of God would come, and that the peace of God would come, and it would be a peace that surpasses all understanding. There's no way that you can figure out something like this. But Lord, I pray, Lord, that as they continue to stand, having done all, to stand firm, that God, you flex your big, faithful, fatherly muscles through this family. We declare restoration and recompense. We declare a repayment for this family. And I, I declare it'll come from the enemy's camp. And that the enemy will pay for what has happened to this family. And we declare the DNA of Christ Jesus, the perfection of Christ Jesus at work in this family. And Lord, we pray that through their prayers, through their investment, Lord, and, and through what you're doing on the earth, Lord, that, that there would be something that comes and shifts. And so we curse this disease. We curse Huntington's disease. We curse it in Jesus' name. And Lord, we ask, Father, for a breakthrough. Lord, let breakthrough come. That people and families, that, 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 that families that have been suffering with this disease, Lord, that they would suffer no more. We curse this disease. And we ask, Lord, for a scroll from heaven with your breakthrough plan to bring this disease to an end for the glory of God. In Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. Please remember the, the, the Pearsons in your prayers uh, this next week. Um, and we, we sure love you. Today we're going to be talking about remembering the testimony of the United States of America. And I'm, I'm going to have you open your Bibles. We're going to go to two scriptures. Are you ready? Yep, that's right. Not one, but two. So you're going to be pretty talented. Because you're going to go to one scripture, and then you're going to flip over to the next scripture. And you're going to hold your finger. I, anyways, I don't have to micromanage the process, but... It's going to be complicated. Compared to most Sundays, this is going to be very complicated. The first scripture you're going to go to, are you ready? I should have you all hold your Bibles over your head like a sword drill. Are you ready? No cheating. No cheating. The winner is going to get a lot of candy. Here we go. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And then I'm also going to pivot, and we're going to go to Psalm 33, verse 12. Okay? So Revelation 12, 11, and Psalm 33, verse 12. I'm going to get started. And they have conquered. Everyone say conquered. conquered. Yep. They have conquered him, that be the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their what? The word of their what? Yep. The word of their testimony. Your testimony determines your authority. No testimony, no authority. You say, but Pastor Darren, I don't have a testimony. You can. You can have one right now. You ready? Two steps. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. Let's try it together. Are you ready? I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth. Jesus Christ. You are my Lord. If 
you have sin, you confess it. I'm a sinner. I sin. I'm in need of your grace and forgiveness. By faith, I receive your forgiveness right now. By faith, I receive your forgiveness right now. Wash me. Right now, from the top of my head, down the soles of my feet, wash me. Wash my body. Wash my soul. Wash my spirit. All right, and while we're at it, while we're here, why don't you just hold out your hands? I'm throwing this one in for free because I'm generous. I don't do this every week, you ready? Just, you, you take it by faith. And by faith, just say, by faith, by faith I, receive I receive the gift, the gift of, the of the person of the Holy Spirit. Come and fill me right now. There he is. Here comes your testimony. Take it right now. All through this room, testimonies are being opened. All through this room, testimonies. All right. Your testimony is your weapon against the enemy. Your testimony is the record of Christ Jesus and the breakthroughs, the accomplishments of what he's done throughout your life. So when you get overwhelmed by the enemy, what do you do? You don't look to the future for a breakthrough. You look to the past for the last breakthrough that you received. So many times we get overwhelmed and we think, okay, God, give me something new. No, no, no. That's too hard. What, when you get overwhelmed, what do you do? You go back to what he's already given you. Here's a question. What was your last breakthrough? Pull it up. I know we're at church, so we don't like to think, but pull it up. Your last breakthrough, okay? There's your ammunition. Why? That is the record. That is the evidence that God really is good and faithful. He didn't fail you last time. So why would he fail you now? Look at the person next to you and say, I'm, I'm loaded. I'm armed and dangerous this morning. And they conquered. Everyone say conquered. You know what that means? It means defeated. If you're part of the kingdom of God, you are a part of a conquering kingdom. What does that mean? We don't co-inhabit a land with darkness. If there's still an enemy in the land, the land has not yet been conquered. What does conquered mean? It means dominate. Just saying, it's not my thing. It's, it's what it says in the Bible. And they dominated. They conquered. They were victorious. This isn't a tie game. It's, we just kicked your butt. And how do we do that? With the blood of the Lamb. It's not in and of ourselves. It's not through our great ideas. It's not by even being good enough. It's not by being holy enough. It's not by being smart enough. I'm not here because I'm holy enough. I'm not here because I'm good enough. Okay? I'm here because of the blood of the Lamb. Because of His mercy. I can't boast in and of myself. I boast in this. I boast in the cross. That when the enemy comes after you, what's, why is he coming after you? To condemn you, to tell you that you're not going to measure up, that you're bad, that you're not anointed, you're not holy, that church doesn't like you, God doesn't like you. What's that? It's accusation. It's condemnation. And what do you do? You remind the enemy that you're covered, you're dripping with thick, red, supernatural blood. You're dripping in the record of Christ's perfection. You're dripping in the DNA of Christ, covered, covered in blood. Remind the enemy of the blood, the blood of the innocent lamb that was shed. And, everyone say, and the word of your testimony. Not my testimony. My testimony won't work for you. You got to have your own testimony. You got to have your own breakthrough. There's no such thing as an old testimony, by the way. 
Ah, he's going to share that one again. That's an old testimony. There's no such thing. Why? Because it's not milk. A testimony is an ever-living record of what Christ Jesus has done. And if Jesus has done it, it doesn't get old. It's an ever-living record. It's a portal. It's a gateway. It's a doorway. You begin talking about what Jesus has done in your past, all of a sudden a portal opens and you begin to see Jesus do more in your present. It's time to start talking about what God has done. I don't care if it was the 80s. I haven't seen God do anything recently. That's because you haven't been talking about what he did last. Never apologize for what the Lord has done in your life. Be proud. Use it. Use the testimony. It's your ammunition. You could have the biggest gun in the world. And if you don't have ammunition, it's pointless. You have radical potential. But if you are not standing in the record of Christ Jesus and his perfection, and if you are not professing what Jesus has done, then you've got a gun, but it is not loaded. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm just going to start talking about Jesus a lot more. Now, enough about you. I know, we, you know, enough about you. Okay, let me tell you something. Our nation has a testimony. Did you know that? The United States of America has a record of God's faithfulness. It's a record of God's faithfulness within our past. And it's ammunition that we can use in the present to begin to shape the future. If you look at Psalm 33, verse 12, it says blessed. Everyone say blessed. blessed. You know what blessed means? It means happy. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Are you, are you telling me that it is possible for there to be a nation on the earth that serves the Lord? Not only is it possible, that is a part of our heritage and legacy as the United States of America. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. We as a country... We have forgotten the testimony of our country. We have forgotten our founding fathers and what their original intent was for our country. And this is a big deal. Why? Because if you forget your past, the enemy can deceive you regarding your future. Because if you forget where you've come from, then you're incapable of going to where he wants to take you. So... In our country, in the United States of America, what was the original intent for our country? That's, that's very, very important. What was the original intent for our country? Well, you got to go back to the Mayflower. you got to look at the pilgrims. Why? Because they didn't just come here. Okay? They had intent in their heart. Anybody who does anything great, they always have intent in their heart. They never just stumble into greatness. That's a, that's a lie. There are no actual Forrest Gumps. There are people with a deliberate agenda, with intent, and they begin going after something, and they've got discipline to not quit, to not give up, and they know that all hell is going to come after them. What's that? That's the story of the Mayflower. When you look at the conditions that they were up against, and what did they do? They wrote a covenant, a document, and we're going to look at that covenant today. It's what's referred to as the Mayflower Compact. I'm, and if you're a part of another religion, I, I don't really apologize, but you do need to know that your religion is not a part of this original Mayflower Compact. These guys had a deliberate agenda for colonizing America. Are you ready? S I C. are you ready? Are you ready? All right, here we go. Now, I'm going to read it for you, because um, a lot of you have gone to public school where they don't teach cursive anymore, so I'm going to read it for you. In the name of God, that's how it starts off, sounds like a prophetic word, in the name of the Lord, amen, we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, okay, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, defender of the faith. 
having undertaken for the glory of the Lord and the advancement of the Christian faith. This is not the mission statement of a church. This is the Mayflower, and this is why they were coming. By the grace of God, having undertaken for the glory of the Lord and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Do by these presents solemnly, mutually, in the presence of God. Isn't it interesting? Listen, let me tell you something. They weren't just acknowledging God. They were writing out a covenant acknowledging the presence of God as they wrote this document. They say, here we are. What happens when you write up a a document in the presence of God? What do you have? You have the fear of the Lord. Okay? One covenant, we combine ourselves together into a civil body, politic, for our better ordering and preservation, furtherance of ends, as foresaid, and by virtue hereof, do intact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, and constitutions, and officers from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise and do submission and obedience. In witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names, Cape Cod on the 11th of November and the Sovereign Lord King James of England, France and Ireland and uh, the 18th of Scotland and the 54th Anno Domini 1620. They begin writing their names. Mr. John Carver, Mr. William Bradford, Mr. Edward Winslow. Don't forget your testimony. This is the testimony of our country. So now you have the, uh, the Americas, yeah? And you have an established British colony. And uh, there is a certain level of independence and autonomy that exists here. And then we begin to see the British begin to impose taxes upon this colony. The problem with this is that these taxes are very high and unfair. And what you have is taxation without representation. So we want your money, but you don't have any say, you don't have any voice, you have no authority. We want your money, but we're giving you no empowerment uh, at all in this. At which point, the, uh, the, the Americans begin to say, this isn't, this isn't fair. And, uh, and at a certain point, uh, Britain declares Massachusetts as a rebellion. They order a British garrison to disarm the rebels, so now the colonizers are now rebels, take away their weapons and arrest their leaders, at which point the Americans respond, you want our guns? You want our leaders? Okay, come and get them. (laughs) Pastor Peter Mullenberg. It was Sunday morning in the year 1776, in the church where Pastor Mullenberg preached, it was a regular service for his congregation, but quite a different affair for Mullenberg himself. Pastor Mullenberg's text for the day was Ecclesiastes chapter 3, where it explains, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted. Coming to the end of his sermon, Pastor Peter Mullenberg turned to his congregation and said, In the language of the holy written scriptures, there was a time for all things, a time to preach and a time to pray, but those times have passed away. As those assembled looked on, Pastor Peter Mullenberg declared, there's a time to fight, and that time has now come. Mullenberg then proceeded to remove his robes, revealing to the shock of his congregation a military uniform. Marching to the back of the church, he shouted, Who among you is with me? And on that day, 300 men from his church stood up and joined Peter Mullenberg. They eventually became the 8th Virginia Brigade fighting for liberty. Frederick Mullenberg's, uh, uh, Frederick Mullenberg, Peter's brother, he was against war and against any sort of fighting, and, um, and he was publicly against him. At which point Peter responded, I'm a clergyman. Yep, it's true. I'm a member of society. I'm the poorest of laymen. And my liberty is as dear to me as any man. Shall I sit still and enjoy myself at home when the best blood of the continent is spilling out? 
So far as I am thinking that I act wrong, I'm convinced it is my duty to do so. I owe this to God and my country. This pastor later became major general under the commander-in-chief, George Washington. Because of his actions, Muhlenberg was given command of a thousand men. After the war, Muhlenberg continued to serve his country. He was a member of a pencil. Now, this is going to be offensive if you're of the belief that Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. After the war, Muhlenberg continued to serve his country. He was a member of the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention. He was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, not once, but three times. He was also elected to the Senate in 1801. Frederick became elected to the House of Representatives. He was also the Speaker of the House twice. Peter Muhlenberg passed away in 1807 at the age of 61. He was a great patriot and can be seen on his tombstone, it reads, He was brave in the field, faithful in the cabinet, honorable in all his transactions, a sincere friend. He was an honest man. Don't forget your testimony. If you forget where you've been, then you can be deceived as to where you should be going. 245 years ago today. 245 years ago today, our nation declared itself to be an independent nation, no longer a colony of England. On July 4th, 1776, a number of our leading citizens wrote a document citing 27 biblical violations that would be known as the Declaration of Independence. It stated our determination to become a free country because our founding fathers believed this was a divine call from God himself. Of the 55 men who formed the Constitution, 52 were active members in their church. Founding fathers like Noah Webster, you know the dictionary guy? He could literally quote the entire Bible from beginning to end, chapter and verse. James Madison, the fourth president of the United States, he is known as the father of the Constitution. He said, we have staked our future on our ability to follow the Ten Commandments with all of our hearts. The founding fathers of our country believed you could not call yourself an American if you subvert the word of God. In his farewell address, George Washington said, you can't have national morality apart from religious principle. Our independence did not come easily. After several difficult years of war, it would finally be won. Nor were our first years as a nation free from problems and controversies, as is still true today. But our forefathers were determined to establish a free and democratic system of government. And the Declaration of Independence, together with our Constitution and the Bill of Rights, became the foundation for this. They have stood the test of time. And on July 4th, we give thanks for the wisdom and the faith and the courage of our founding fathers. Although July 4th is not a holy day like Christmas or Easter, for many Americans, July 4th is a time to reflect on God's goodness as a nation. Molded into the Liberty Bell itself is a scripture from Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10. This is what it says. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land and unto inhabitants thereof. Don't forget your testimony. Why? Your testimony is your authority. No testimony, no authority. No authority, no empowerment. No empowerment, no opportunity to make change. 
But if you have a testimony, then you have authority. And if you have authority, then you have empowerment. And if you have empowerment, what does that mean? You have the opportunity in your nation and in your generation to be able to execute justice, to make things right, and to be a part of God's intent, not just for our country, but for the entire earth, that none would perish, but that all would have the fruit of life and life abundantly. Don't forget where you've come from. Don't forget your fathers, your forefathers. Don't forget your own personal testimony. Why? Otherwise, you'll be a victim of your future. And there's way too many Christians today that are living like victims of the present and victims of the future. And yeah, we've all been through some stuff, haven't we? And yet we are not victims. We are victorious. We do not live our lives with a victim mentality, sobbing about yesterday. No, we live our lives seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places, knowing that he didn't just die. He died, he was buried, he resurrected, he ascended, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. What Jesus did was not a tragedy. He overcame sin, sickness, disease, and death. He, in his perfection, died so that we in our imperfection may live And to come into union with his perfection, his holiness, this is what is the gospel. This is the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. And with this gospel, with this revelation of the Christ, came a desire to worship, came a desire to establish a place where there would be representation. And here's the thing, you guys, is that... God wants to establish in us a revelation of our true past, not a changed past, not a rewritten past. The enemy is doing everything that he can to erase the testimony of our country. And this is what I know. You can take the Ten Commandments down from our walls. You can tear down whatever statues you want to tear down. You can have whatever agenda you want to have to bring into our public schools. But when you cut this country, our country will always believe in one nation under one God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And listen, that wasn't framed up through a good idea. That was framed up through a God idea and principles that came back to a Judeo-Christian faith. People say, wait, this sounds, like, uh, this sounds like nationalism. This sounds like you're combining Americanism with your faith. Yep. Well, that's, that's evil. That makes you a domestic terrorist. No. It makes us missionaries. We are all missionaries to the United States of America. We have the blueprints. We have the scrolls. We have the documents. They're hanging on our walls. They're there to remind us where we've come from. Because if you know where you've come from, then you know where we're going. Where are we going? To the restoration of all things. We're not here to partner with a subversive spirit, being our own sanctified version of Christian Antifa demolish and destroy and frame out accusation and criticism, being a little pessimistic rapturous. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That wasn't fair. I take it back. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I got to be careful because I, I, I love, I go back and forth. I swear. Okay, here we go. We have to have an appreciation and an honor Because men have died and men have given their life and they have framed out documents and the holy presence of the Lord. So therefore, thinking thinking nation cannot become a swear word in the church. Listen, follow me. Follow me right now. Let's, Let's come back. Why? Because God came to Abram while he was in his tent and said, I want to bless you. But the only way I can bless you is you're going to have to leave your tent 
and you're going to have to come outside, and you're going to have to look up at the stars. How many of you have ever been in a location where when you looked up, you could actually see the stars? If we're going to come into where God is taking us, we're going to have to leave. We're going to have to leave our sheltered environments and sheltered belief systems. Why? Because we have a problem. What's our problem? Our God doesn't think small. He only thinks big. So what does he do? He takes Abram out of his tent and he says, look up. And he, he tells, this is funny. This shows that God has a sense of humor. He says, Abram, yes. I want you to count them. Count the, count the stars? Yeah. Okay, one, two, are you serious, God? Three, four, God, this is impossible, there's, 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 there's too many. And God says, this is what I'm holding in my heart for you. Abram, I want to bless you, and I want to make a what out of you? I want to make a nation out of you. Hey, follow me. He says, Abraham, I want to bless you. Why? So that when people look at you, they see a prototype of who I am. Listen, if, if it says that uh, they conquered the enemy, okay? So if you haven't conquered the enemy, then how are you representing who God is to your friends and family? Like, if you, if you are conquered, if you're being defeated nonstop, if you're getting it handed to you, I'm just in warfare. I'm just going through warfare. Okay, that, that's a bummer. But um, how long have you been getting shot up? 28 years. Okay, that's not a season of warfare. That's, that's a lifestyle of just getting beaten down by the enemy. And the Bible says, and they conquered the enemy. What does that mean? At a certain point, the gunfire stops. And at a certain point, you begin to shatter the teeth of your enemies. It's not my language. That's King David's language. At a certain point, you stop getting bit by the snake, and you put the snake under your heel, and you squash it like a cigarette. Squash the head of the liar. Why are we always getting it handed to us? Because we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten where we've been. We've forgotten the faithfulness of God. And we've forgotten the stars. And we started thinking small and individualistic, thinking that that was religious or spiritual. Maybe the Lord wants you to have a small dream. No. Maybe the Lord only wants you to live your whole life and just reveal Jesus to one person. The Lord said, that I'm going to have a very small existence and I'm not really going to do anything on the earth for him. That's what he's called me to do. No, no, it's not. You've been talking to the wrong God. Why? Because every time God comes and speaks to people throughout the scriptures, he always blows their mind and he always gives them a mission that's going to require faith. Moses, he's a stutterer. He's running from God. He's a murderer. He's a fugitive. And God comes to him in a burning bush and says, you're my man. Yo, Mo. <laughs> you my boy, B. You're my man. I can't be your man. I'm disqualified. I'm a murderer. I murdered an Egyptian. No, you my man. You about to liberate all my people. But, 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 and I'm going to take care of that too. What, what you, you, think, you think God just created you um, to, to have a cute house on the block, nice, nice little pick of fence, and fund your, your 401k, be moral, be responsible, die, and then go to heaven and start the real adventure? We got to hang out with Kevin Zadias last week, which is amazing. And he, he was talking about how he went to heaven, how he died. He was gone for like, what, five hours or something? You know, what's that? Oh, that's better. It's more realistic. Let's go with 45 minutes. I heard something, I was like, man, that's a long time. I thought it was five hours, but I'm not good with numbers, so he's, he's gone for 45 minutes. When he was in heaven, he realized, he realized, 
what, what, what was possible through him, what he actually could have achieved while he was living on the earth. And, and, he, and, he, and, and he was like, oh, like, I could have accomplished so much, so much more. And he realized that all the limitations that, that were on him were his own limitations that he had placed on himself. You know what? You need to go back to your testimony. What testimony? The testimony of your forefather that was called out of his tent and looked up at the stars. Why? Because I'm claiming that for myself. Sons and descendants of Abraham. That when Abraham walked out of his tent and saw the stars and God said, I want to make a nation out of you, he was also speaking to the sons of Abraham. I want to bless you. I want to bless you so much, Merits, so that when people look at the Merit family, they see a prototype of a God people, of a Jesus people on the earth. And then as the Merits are blessed, they're not thinking individualistic blessing anymore. Now they're thinking nations. Why? Because they've tapped into the God of nations. They've tapped into the Lord of blessing who is thinking about the restoration of cities and nations. But the problem is we forget. We forget where we've been. We forget what God spoke to us. And then we just start living our lives unto ourselves. We think of blessing as individualistic. We stop thinking about nation. We stop thinking about redemption. We stop thinking about restoration. And we believe the lie that we're victims of the present. But we're not. We've been through some stuff. Man, that's a bummer. But we're saying, I'm not a victim. I'm victorious. I know my past, therefore I know my future. We have the record of the, third, of the second great awakening. You have the record of that. You have the record of the first great awakening. You have the record of Azusa Street. You have the record and testimony of Acts chapter 2. You have the record and testimony of Joel chapter 2. You've got the record of what's been done and the promise of the Father that he will pour out his spirit on all flesh, on all flesh, and that there would be a dynamic that brings such, such a um, uh, 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 favor uh, on, on to holy communities that there'd be such radical blessing and, and we see this, this, this tension that exists between God and his very own people because he's always saying you're my people Israel you're my people Israel you're my people I love you I want to bless you hey remember everything I've done remember everything I've done for you now look at everything I want to do but what would happen Israel would just keep forgetting just like America just keeps forgetting just like the church just keeps forgetting we just keep on forgetting in Deuteronomy chapter 8 the Lord says hey take care like, like you forget forgotten the Lord your God. And when you've eaten and fallen, you've built your houses and you live in them. And, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and, and all that you have is multiplied, and then, your, then your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord. Your heart gets lifted up, but you forget the Lord's heart. You forget your God who, who, who and, and then the, the reminder, remember it was me I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Remember it was me I brought you out of the house of slavery. Remember it was me who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness. Remember it was me with, uh, uh, that, that rescued from the fiery serpents and the scorpions and, the, and remember, remember the thirsty ground where there was no water. It was me who brought you water out of a flinty rock. It was me who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might be able to humble you and test you to do you good in the end beware lest you say in your heart my power and the might of my hand has gotten me to this wealth he says beware lest you think it's your greatness that got you into this prosperity you shall remember everyone just declare I shall remember take that hand put it on your heart and say heart soul remember remember speak to your spirit and say remember remember Solomon would say that, 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 that the record of, of eternity has been embedded within our spirit. What does that mean? It means, it means, it means that, the, the, that the testimony of eternity is, is inside of us. It's just that our soul has amnesia and we've forgotten where we've been. Therefore, we've forgotten where we are going. What happens as you begin to engage with Holy Spirit? What happens when you get filled with the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit comes and testifies to your spirit. There's an awakening and your spirit cries out. Abba, Daddy. There's the awakening and the remembrance of eternity, where you've come from and where you're going. Just declare, I shall remember the Lord my God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers 
as it is to this day. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. What are we doing today? We're remembering. We're remembering the record of our nation. Why? Because the third great awakening is going to be an awakening, not just for a denomination and not just for a local house. It's going to be an awakening that comes to our nation. Why? It's time for America to remember. Because we've forgotten. We've forgotten. And we do believe there's going to be a great end time harvest. And we do believe there's going to be a harvest of harvesters. And we do believe that, uh, that, that, mission, that waves of missionaries is going to be like Azusa times 10. Times 20, 20x, 30x. It's going to be like Acts chapter 2 times 10. It's going to be like Joel chapter 2. The promises there times 10. That, 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 that take everything that God has done. Now get out of your little tent and look up. He wants to blow your mind with his goodness, with his faithfulness. He wants to blow your mind with his gentleness. He wants to blow your mind. He wants to, through you, reveal who he is in your community. And he wants to establish a nation so that when other nations begin to look, they see a prototype, just like Israel, they see a prototype of heaven. The city, the nation that is to come. And heaven shall come down and kiss the earth. The new and heavenly perfect Jerusalem, the restoration of all things. Yeah? Hey, we've forgotten. Our kids have forgotten. And it's not the school's job to get your kids to remember. It's going to be harder to remember. As more paintings are taken down, more t statues are torn down, as the enemy does everything that he can to get our country to forget. It's going to be harder to remember. We have to impress these things on our children. We have to tell our children the true story of our country so that they don't, have, they don't believe the lie that America is a disgrace. It's not SRC's job to teach your children about Jesus. That's your job, parents. It's not the school's job to educate your children. That's your, that's your job. I heard one guy say, I, I give my children their, their assignments. And if they don't get their homework done, that's fine because my assignments come first because I value my education as a father more than I value the education of the system. Got to raise the bar. Tell the story. Tell the story. The Israelites would tell the story. They would tell the story. They would sing the story. They would impress the story. We can't forget. We can't forget. We can't forget. He's going to make a nation out of you. He wants to bless you. Time to break off every small thinking spirit, every demonic thing that would like to keep you attached to some sort of generational poverty. It's not for you. It's not for you. Slavery is not for you. It's not for your family. It's time to step into freedom. Anyways, if you're watching online, I'm going to let you go because I got to do some stuff here with our, with our family. Happy 4th of July. It's time to celebrate your independence. You're independent. You're free. That's a gift. It's not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. Let your independence create passion and worship for Jesus. That we're not codependent. We don't have some sort of weird dysfunctional relationship with another country that can dictate to us our behaviors. We're free. We're free. We're free. If you're online, stop trash talking America. We're a free, we're still a free country. And that's not going to change. It's not going to change. All right, say goodbye to everybody online. Goodbye, guys. See you later. Hey, James.